Um, hopefully you'll stay with us, uh, Dr. Brohe, uh, for the panel. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce David Shellington. Uh, Dr. Shellington is a pediatric intensive care physician in San Diego, California. Uh, he is also recently retired from the uh, U.S. Navy, uh, where he spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan. And to help complement uh, one of the biggest challenges that, e that exists is pulmonary injury to these children. And David, thank you so much for being with us. No, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Perfect. sure can. All right, terrific. Uh, so my goal for this morning is to present a very practical approach to the treatment of pediatric pulmonary blast injury, since this is a phenomenon that's going to be seen very commonly after any, any kind of blast injury in the pediatric population. And as Dr. Eichelberger said, though I'm currently at the University of California in San Diego, the majority of the tidbits that I'm going to present in this talk uh, I learned at the NATO Rule 3 Multinational Medical Unit down in Kandahar, Afghanistan. So as, uh, as far as what I'm going to try to cover this morning, I'm going to review uh, very briefly the epidemiology of pediatric pulmonary blast injury. We're going to talk a little bit again about blast injury physics in relation to the lung. I'm going to go over some of the pathology and, and keys to making the diagnosis for blast injury. And then most importantly, I'm going to talk about the, the acute ICU management of these patients and, and maybe some pearls that can help people out when they get into trouble. Um, and then we'll, we'll close with new concepts. So to, to quote from Dr. Edwards' terrific article on blast injury in children, um, about 20% of blast injuries in Afghanistan and Iraq had very severe chest trauma. And the, the interesting thing about this is even when you break it down on an age-by-age -age basis across the population, it is fairly uniform at 20%. So these are very common injuries that you're going to encounter if, in an operational setting. Um, Blast injury, uh, theoretically, you have this very large release of energy from an explosion, and what that generates is a, uh, a huge overpressure wave followed by an underpressure wave, a negative phase wave. And essentially what that does is it, it causes shear across tissue interfaces. And if you think about the lung, you have all these little pockets of air and pockets of tissue, and at every one of those interfaces, there's going to be shear stress and damage that occurs. You can see that there is, uh, you know, this is just an, another diagram that shows the, the mechanism of blast injury. And essentially, you have the primary injury, which is the blast itself. Again, the, the secondary blast injury, which is going to be shrapnel and missiles that are propelled by the explosion into the patient. And then the tertiary, tertiary blast injury is going to be when, when the child, when the patient strikes a fixed object and causes additional damage. Additionally, there's quaternary injury if you're close enough to the explosion, which is going to be the, the, the effects of the burn, the, the, the fire from the explosion, and its effects on the body and the airway. So to go into the injury pattern, um, and, and there's a lot of blending across these, but the, the primary blast injury is going to cause primarily pulmonary contusion. And the way I think of this as an intensivist is it is going to cause essentially hemorrhagic pulmonary edema as a, as a sequela from the blast. Um, additionally, you're going to get some potentially airway trauma because you have the air tissue interfaces all throughout the airways. And if you're close enough to the blast injury, those airways can actually rupture. The secondary injury is going to cause penetrating lung injury, and, and, and just as a tidbit, I want to distinguish that this causes a different kind of hemorrhage, because this causes the frank arterial hemorrhage that you may see if you have a missile that, that lacerates a small artery within the lung, and I'll talk about how to distinguish those clinically in a little bit. The tertiary injury is going to be, your, again, your pulmonary contusions if you strike an object, um, causing more injury to the lung, and you can also get rib fractures as well from that, um, and it may help precipitate the uh, pneumothorax and hemothorax that you can see. And then uh, the quaternary injury, as I mentioned, is your, in, is your inhalational burns. This is a, a radiograph from a patient who essentially su sustained a p severe pulmonary contusion as a result of the blast injury, and we'll show some CT scans later on in the presentation. Um, but essentially, you can see kind of that, that fluffy alveolar infiltrate over there in the right lung, and, and again, a little bit on the left. What you, what you will get if you actually operate on the patient is what you can see is down at the bottom of the screen, nice pink healthy tissue, but where the PC is labeled for pulmonary contusion, that is essentially a lung that is going to be filling up with blood uh, due to the severity of the injury. 
the the typical uh, description of these injuries is the so-called butterfly pattern of of pulmonary infiltrates, um, which you can see in A there. Again, there's in B you can get a, a hint of those butterfly-shaped pulmonary infiltrates, and in C on the on the CT scan you can start to see the um, the those small air sacs filling up with blood um, as you see the, the large airways going through the proximal lung. You're also going to get from penetrating injury, um, as mentioned earlier, pneumothorax and hemothorax, and, and this is one of the things which can really cause severe compromise to your patient that you need to be aware of. The physics of these injuries are much more complicated than, than what I would lead you to believe in the first slide because it, 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 the, the energy from the blast is going to vary widely with your distance from the blast. As you get further away, the energy drops off. But if you have walls or open walls in the area of the blast, they're going to tend to cause differences in the blast waves that propagate through the, uh, the structure. And despite the fact that you may be away from the blast, you could still get a fairly severe injury. Um, additionally, uh, if you're wearing body armor, that is going to be obviously protective. Um, and the chest wall compliance is going to differ widely from your, your adults to your children, which may affect the severity of the lung disease that you see. So again, talking about adult versus children, I can say that the one thing that made treating adult blast injuries much easier was the presence of body armor. It, it does do its job when it's worn. The, the children tended to have much more severe injuries anecdotally from my experience because they were obviously not wearing their body armor when they were in field. <laughs> This is the, the most common rash that we treated in Afghanistan, and this is peppering from uh, essentially blast injury. And each of those little pockets, each of those little divots in the skin that you can see is the opportunity for a missile to enter the chest cavity. So if you see this on a patient, you need to react very quickly and very seriously. Um, Rapid control of the airway should be obtained, and if the patient is in even a mild to moderate degree of distress, if you see that rash across the chest, I would have a very low threshold to get airway control because you have no idea what sort of uh, quaternary, quaternary injury, burn injury may have occurred to the airway that may also be complicating your, uh, your further treatment. Um, you should have a very low threshold to put chest tubes in these patients because, again, the, you know, we, we saw very, very small surface wounds that um, had clearly penetrated the chest cavity and gone into the lung and potentially lacerated arteries and large airways. So if you see, it, if you see that peppering and the patient is mildly to moderately unstable, um, and no one is going to fault you for putting in a chest tube sooner rather than labor, later. And then finally, as, as Dr. Broey just very eloquently talked about, um, damage control resuscitation is the flavor of the afternoon with these patients, and I'll get into a, a little bit more of the reason why. Um, as far as operative interventions, as a, a pediatric intensivist, far be it for me to tell, tell the surgeons when to go in. I'll just say on the, on the ICU side, I'm not going to be upset hearing that my patient had a, a bronchoscopy coming out from the operating room to make sure that there's no airway injury. And uh, again, I would have a low threshold for thoracostomy or thoracotomy with these patients to diagnose any underlying injuries that might have occurred. Over the first 24 hours after your injury, this is going to get worse, and this is essentially hemorrhage filling up the lungs in, in the area of a pulmonary contusion. Essentially, all those capillaries are torn and, and leaking blood into the airway, and as you can imagine, this part of the lung is going to be very difficult to oxygenate and ventilate. So as far as a practical ventilation strategy, um, what I would encourage every, anyone who deals with this kind of injury to do is more PEEP. Um, if you have blood coming out of the endotracheal tube, you don't have enough PEEP. Um, if you can't get your mean airway pressure up high enough that you're, you're comfortable managing it with PEEP, go to the oscillator. And there was a, a nice study uh, released from the operational side of things where they said that the majority of these patients, with the exception of one, could be managed on an oscillator. Um, you know, a lot of people like to start their airway pressures low and then work them up. But what I'd say to that is, would you put light pressure on a bleed and then expect the bleeding to stop? So don't be afraid to start with a PEEP of 15 or 20 and then work it down if you don't need it. If you're hemorrhaging on those high mean arterial pressures, you need to have a serious discussion with your surgeons or if you're the surgeon, have a discussion with the intensivist about going to the operating room. And the one thing that I throw out there, if you're not in the ICU all the time, uh, respiratory therapists love to suction blood out of endotracheal tubes. And if you were unclamping these patients from their ventilator to go down and suction that blood out, you have no airway pressure. You actually have negative airway pressure, which is going to precipitate more bleeding. So I would tell my RTs not to suction these kids unless it was necessary. I would clamp the endotracheal tube if we were ever taking them off the ventilator. Um, and again, I was very protective of endotracheal tubes and, and maintaining PEEP.
Um, as far as ICU pitfalls, if you have blood in the endotracheal tube, it can clot, and that will cause your patient to decompensate acutely. Um, atelectasis and pneumothorax are two major problems, and then um, over-resuscitation can be an issue because as you over-resuscitate, your pulmonary pressures are going to your, your pulmonary capillary pressures, excuse me, are going to rise, and so sometimes you do need to use a touch of Lasix on these patients. Finally, just for a, a, a brief kind of uh, case discussion, you can see that one lung is very healthy, one lung is clearly not very healthy. When we put these patients on 10 per kilo tidal volumes, what you, think, what, you, what you would like to think you're doing is giving 5 cc's per kilo to either lung, and in reality what you're doing is giving 20 cc's per kilo to the good lung and nothing to the bad lung. Additionally, you're going to have shunt through the bad lung, which is going to give you worse hypoxemia. So. One thing to think about is placing a double lumen and a tracheal tube. And although it, we did it once, it wasn't fun. It's not an enjoyable experience. It may be something that uh, helps save your patient because you can use two different ventilation strategies on the lung. So finally, in summary, uh, we talked about the four mechanisms of blast physics. We talked about some of the pulmonary blast physiology. And again, I, I, I like PEEP and mean airway pressure in these patients and would encourage you to use them. So uh, this is going to affect about 20% of your, of your patients, and uh, I, I hope that I helped you manage them. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Shellington. That was outstanding. Um, is Dr. Sheridan on the uh, line? We can get him. We'll get him on the line. Amanda, uh, can you go ahead and get and Dr. Dr. Sheridan? Either he or Dr. Holcomb. But thank you. All three of you made fantastic points. and. Uh, I thought we'd just a open up uh, for some questions until we have our other next uh, our next two people on the on the uh, on the line. Yes, sir.